I'm Ryan. I'm Dave. And uh, today we're talking about Office 365, but it's really a cover story uh, for a whole bunch of other things. So let's see how it goes. Um, first off, there's a lot of legalese up there, but the long and short of it is we are incredible liars. Uh, do not believe in what we say. Do not buy stock on what we say. Dave uses elastic at home. Um, it's very <laughs> awkward for everyone involved. Hey guys, I'm Dave. Um, I work at Splunk. Been there for about the last four years. Um, been doing a lot of, uh, uh, been doing security for a long time. Um, lots of different roles. Uh, we're, we've been here for, for a number of years now um, at, at this event, the third, I think, and um, we, we always are, are very grateful for the opportunity to, to come in and, and meet with old friends and, and to, to share some ideas about some, some new things that we have going on. Um, I've done a lot with SANS from being a student um, in particular and, a, and uh, going through a lot of the certifications. So we're huge, huge proponents of, of the SANS mission and we're, we're happy to be here. Uh, my name is Ryan Kobar. I've um, been doing cyber stuff for a while now. Uh, worked at the DOD, worked at DARPA, worked in the UK home office for a while, private sector, lived all over the world doing fun, interesting things, trying to be the best Ryan I can be. Uh, Co-creator of Boss of the Sock along with Dave, for those of you who have heard of that. Uh, and we do a lot of SANS talks because we love sharing and educating and doing what we can to help back to the community. Which really leads to this. Uh, Dave and I have a combined 40 plus years of experience, most of it weighted on the Tom Hanks side. Um, and we do a lot of things. Uh, we are primarily, our bias is network defenders. Uh, we're blue teamers through and through, that's what we bleed through, but we love threat intelligence and the application and creation of it. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of things today that we're kind of leaning forward on. Uh, there's probably subject matter experts in this room. Uh, please don't yell at us if we're wrong. Dave has a very fragile ego. I don't want to hold him crying anymore. Just saying, talking to you, Rob. <laughs> All right, I do, one thing I do have is a cold. Um, so, um, and it, mostly I can hide it, except for when I laugh at Ryan's jokes, which I shouldn't, but then I start coughing. So um, if you hear me coughing, you'll know that you actually entertained me. Um, so one of the things that, that we always like to do, well, kind of our formula for these talks is we always try to bring something um, one, that's a little bit unique. Nothing that's like earth shattering from a, like we're not splitting the atom or anything, but, but one thing that we always try to do is, is give, you, give you all something that you can take home um, and use the, the, the very next day back, back at the office. Um, and we use Splunk to do that. Generally we create something new um, and we use Splunk sort of as a canvas for that. Um, but the ideas here are not, not tied to Splunk in any way, and it's not a sales pitch. Um, but uh, we work there, so we use it. So quick agenda for those of you who have good eyes in the back. Uh, we're going to talk about spear phishing. Is it, is it or is it not still a thing? Uh, we're going to make some ramen. Uh, we're going to make it at home, which is a little bit of a callback, threat intelligence. We're going to faff around for a while, file now frameworks, which may be a new term for many of you. Then we're going to ingest all the things. We're going to completely disregard the keynote and just bring it all in, okay? Uh, then we're gonna pick out the chashu, right? Get the really tasty bits of threat intelligence and raise it to the surface. And then we're gonna plant a victory garden for tomorrow. <laughs> we'll find out what that means. But first, uh, Sands always gives us a dubious honor of being the yawn slot. So much like my puppies, many of you have bellies full of food, a lot of healthy cinnamon rolls. So what I want you all to do is stand up. Come on, stand up, it's American flag. By law in DC, you have to do this in Virginia. You do not wanna <laughs> suffer the penalty. The furlough does not exist right now. Stretch it out and stay up, stay up, stay up. All right, if you have never been targeted by spear phishing, sit down, your organization. Okay, if anyone sat down, do not put your customer details in their org. Which thank through is no one. If you have never automated the extraction of indicators of compromise from spear phishing emails into your organization, sit down. This is pretty good, okay, we got a couple hesitancy. A lot of people still standing, we gotta get through this presentation. If you've never photoshopped a photo of you've got mail and labeled yourself as Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks, sit down. <laughs> okay, one person really had to think about that, which is a little bit more worrisome than I thought I was gonna have to deal with. Okay, so the goal is, this is a common threat. Yeah, so, um spear is still a big problem, right? It's still, still the, 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 one of the main ways that attackers are, are, are gaining a foothold and kicking off attacks against our organizations. Sometimes it's easy to, to forget that, although we, we talk to customers all the time who 
who tell us that's the, the main thing that they spend time on, both from an investigative perspective and, and from a detection perspective. Um, that's really backed up by things that you see out there. Uh, the DBIR report um, came out and, and said 98% of, of, of some of these incidents are, are um, kicked off in this way through spear phishing. So um, it kind of sets the stage for why we care about this and why we continue to want to um, do analysis on these things and um, frankly to try and pull some threat intel um, from, from these spear phishing attempts. One of the big things that, um, that we wanted to cover in this talk was just this transition. So looking at, at email, trying to extract as much threat intel as we can from email, <clears throat> excuse me, but doing that in, in, in the context of this shift from on-prem email to the cloud. Um, <clears throat> off, <clears throat> excuse me, Office 365 um, becoming wildly popular. Probably a lot of your organizations use this, I imagine. Is there a lot, show of hands, people using, yeah, there so. We. Very, very popular, of course. Fortune did an article recently kind of talking about, you know, the resurgence of Microsoft and, you know, how they've driven their trillion dollar uh, market cap. And a lot of that is through cloud and through services like Office 365. Um, a lot of some impressive numbers up there, but really comes back to the fact that we um, aren't really going to stop this trend of, of moving um, email infrastructure into the cloud um, and away from on-prem. I was talking to somebody last night at the, at the, um, at the social event and they were talking about Perl scripts that they've had for like 20 years that they use to, um, to, to dive into um, exchange email inboxes and pull out indicators and, and do investigations. And I was like, wow, um, per Perl scripts was, 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 a, was a pretty big, uh, pretty big step for me. But, um, uh, you know, certainly PowerShell and, and, and more broadly, right, we, we have these, um, we have ways of, of of interacting with on-prem email infrastructure, but we don't really have those same capabilities, at least not right now, when we move to the cloud. And there was a great presentation last year by Scott Roberts, uh, there, there he is, um, the dearly departed, just, just joking, I think he's in the room, um, <laughs> and where he talked about the best threat intelligence you can make is the threat intelligence you generate in your own shop. As a network defender, this resonates incredibly well. Uh, when I buy a threat feed, it may or may not apply to me, but if I have a fusion center who's developing threat intelligence specifically curated for my environment, that's the best, right? We're gonna weight that really highly. We're gonna use that incredibly well. Um, but when you make this in the cloud, how does this work, right? And there's more than just creating threat intelligence. Uh, there's a great model here, if you're not familiar with this, the F3EAD. Threat intelligence, you have to find it, you have to extract it, exploit it, do something with it, and disseminate it, right? Not every indicator of compromise is a Coventry problem. You don't have to let the city burn, you can actually use them and, you know, consequences be damned, we've saved ourselves sort of thing. But how do you actually do that in a world where you can't get access to all the data? So we were curious, can I use Office 365 to create useful threat intelligence and then action it? We like to create hypotheses and kind of work through it, and this is the one that kind of kicked off the talk. <laughs> a little bit of a reference here to Dr. King for yesterday's celebration. Um, the vision's a little cloudy, like the big things are there, uh, but when you try to get the metadata and actually read the incredible inscriptions on the bottom of the statue, it is covered up very well with the cloud, <laughs> right? This is what I found. These screens, not really meant to be read, uh, but they are indicative of what you see in Office 365 for trying to either implement or extract threat intelligence from Office 365, right? And what I found as I tried to do this is I could not block by subject, file name, hash, or keywords. I could create rules but I couldn't actually put it before a rule. I had to actually put it inside of uh, some sort of a changing the direction of the traffic, right? I could block by IP, uh, but my testing was a little hazy. It was only for the source IP or the from IP. If there was an IP address in that header that I wanted to alert or block on, I wasn't able to get telemetry from it. Uh, and you could block by sender, email address, or domain. I did have a couple of issues sometimes blocking by message ID, which would be something like a reseller like YMLP or something like that, .com. That was a little dubious uh, working all the time. And you can search, uh, but have fun. For those of you who've tried to use the e-discovery modules of Office 365, it is horrific. It is horrendous and it is disgusting. I'm very happy to say that. <laughs> it will work about 20% of the time, and good luck if you have a giant um, corpus of data to get through. 
All right, let's talk a little bit about what you can get from Office 365 as far as <clears throat> a log, from a logging perspective. So this is the message trace console in Office 365. A lot of you might be familiar with this. Um, and there is some metadata that you can get um, on a, a message by message basis. Um, this is what one of those logs looks like. Um, it actually looks like there's a lot there, but when you, when you, um, when you break it down, it's really some very, very basic things, right? It's, it's a, you know, a to address, a from address, a subject, and a few other things. There's size, but it's, that's not really attachment size or anything like that. It's more the entire size of the, the transmission. Um, and um, although this is useful, um, it doesn't really meet our needs from what we're looking for from a threat intel perspective to, to um, you know, understand a little bit more deeply the characteristics of these messages. Notably, uh, no hash. Um, so no hashes for, for attachments. And although hashes maybe aren't you know, the, 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 at the top of the, the pyramid of pain, um, still very useful. And a lot of folks rely on them um, to, do, to do matching against services. Um, actually, it leads into um, an interesting article. Um, we're not going to dive too deeply into this. But if you're interested in just in general, um, the, all the different fields, all the different headers that you can, um, that you can take advantage of inside a typical email message. Um, check out this article. It's from Squirrel. Um, and it goes through literally like dozens and dozens of different um, email headers, um, what, why they're important, what typical values might look like, and what it might look like um, if some of those values are, are a little bit off and, and what might be a trigger, mostly from a hunting perspective. Um, but we're going to show you how to get literally all, the all those headers that you would need um, to embark on something like that um, from cloud email. Um, and I had to change my slides real fast. Is, uh, is, is Matt in the room? I can't see. I don't know why I'm looking. Uh, hopefully he is. He had a great talk about an hour and a half, two hours ago, where he talked about all these techniques that the BEC scammers are using. And as I learned at the end of the talk, as the rest of you did, they no longer say scammers. It's really an advanced tactics, right? These, this is advanced. Email encoding, obfuscation of the body. Good luck trying to pull that out of a message trace that has 13 fields, none of which are the body. Um, Unicode play, there's nothing there to identify Unicode play or pull it out. Transpose character and substitution domains, you're not going to see that because you're not getting that information, right? So just in the talks we've had today about business email compromise, we can already see that Office 365 does not have the fidelity of logs or information that you can extract that I see from a network defense or threat intelligence to do your job, right? And this is well known. Cybox, right? They talk about this. This is a standard that goes through all the different email headers that a threat intelligence person might want so we can put it in some sort of XML or JSON schema. That is a 22-page long document. That's a lot more pages than they have fields, right? So after this, I felt pretty good, or actually horrific, I don't think I can use Office 365 to generate an action useful threat intelligence. But can we do it before Microsoft? So this is a very traditional method, right? You have malicious bomb emails coming in through some sort of uh, appliance before the actual Office 365, right? I'm not going to name vendor names. They do very well. They do what they do. Um, and this is a very common. This is what I want to do. Uh, this is my, my go-to because I'm a network defender who grew up in a world of brick and mortar. Uh, but is this really applicable for the cloud? Uh, the problem with this is, with Office 365, you are paying a lot of money, in my opinion, for one really great feature among all the others, the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center. For those of you not familiar with Mystic, this is one of the world's best threat intelligence teams. Uh, Microsoft has an amount of data to pull to defend your network that is unparalleled in the world. It makes governments cry when they think about how much information Microsoft can get and apply to threat intelligence. They are phenomenal. And when you use this model, you completely bypass that defense. Because the way that they do their preliminary defenses, from what I understand, uh, reading the white papers and the blogs, which to be fair, by the time this presentation is done, may be different <laughs> uh, because of the pace of the Office 365 development team. They put a lot of work in domain reputation and IP reputation and things like that. And that's where they're doing a lot of their um, basically blocking. And you lose that functionality by going to a forefront. I'm not going to sit here and say one way or the other, is that good, is that bad? That's up for your organization, your risk appetite. But what it does mean is you lose the entire power of the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center Fusion cell. So I, 
I'd prefer not to do it before. Yeah, uh, Microsoft recommends don't do it that way. So oh, yeah, it's actually in their official documentation <coughs> somewhere. Don't put anything in front of yeah. us. Um, although that, that would be, that was kind of my, my first instinct when we first started thinking about this as well. But um, so we, we kind of started thinking about alternate ways to, to, to extract this data. Um, and, and we say, can I do after Microsoft or maybe could be better said in parallel with, with how they do their processing. So we came up with this um, idea and tested it quite a bit here. We'll, we'll show you um, some details here. But one thing we'll talk about first is file analysis frameworks. And, and so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna essentially use a file analysis framework to help us extract all sorts of observables from email as they're, as they're um, being ingested, or as the emails are coming into the organization. And a lot of people aren't familiar with these. I mention file analysis frameworks to, to our, our customers all the time. Um, and many, many organizations are not familiar with these, so um, we wanted to kind of showcase um, the power of using one of these. Um, this one is, is, a, is a slide uh, provided by the Stoke, uh, uh, our friends at, at Punch and, and Stoke, um, but it really kind of describes how file analysis frameworks work in general. Um, take a file, throw it into the, the framework, depending on the plugins that you have configured in, in the file analysis framework, you can do all sorts of things to that file in an automated way, a consistent and repeatable way, and then ultimately create some output that you can analyze, um, usually in, in some other platform. Um, there's a few that are, are very popular, like a boss, I think a lot of people are maybe familiar with that one. That's the first one I ever learned about and read about a number of years ago. Um, there's a, 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 a fork of that called uh, FSF. Um, there's also uh, Strelka, which is down there in the, the lower right corner, which was created by Target. Um, and I've heard really great things about that. I think they're having success with that as well. It was released fairly recently. Um, the one we're going to talk about today is, is Stoke, um, which is um, a very, very powerful file analysis framework. Um, and now it's Ryan's turn to talk. You're done now. Get off the table. Um, a little anxious on the trigger there. So what these do, these file analysis frameworks do, is they look at files. And a lot of you are saying, I'm here for the Office 365 talk, or I feel really embarrassed getting up and walked out right now. Um, at the end of the day, an email is just a file. It's a .eml, it's a .msg. Uh, for any of the forensicators in the room, you know this intrinsically, but a lot of threat intel analysts aren't quite as clear on that. So what I want to make clear is, they are files. So if you have a file analysis framework, it will process them. And the beautiful thing about an email is it's really just a key value file, right? It has a delimiter of a colon, from colon email address to colon email address. The bad thing about email and SMTP, it is like the world's loosest RFC protocol. You can do just about anything to it as long as it has a from and a to, right? So there's a lot of things that adversaries slip in or move or accidentally typo in their scripts that you're losing because you're not getting that value. So what do these FAFs give me? Um, I say an asterisk because all of them have different functions, they have different pros and cons, but generally these are some things you're gonna get with a file analysis framework. Uh, the first is IOC extraction, right? So it's gonna go through any file that's attached and actually extract indicators of compromise automatically. It's gonna go through the body and extract indicators of compromise automatically. It's going to do emails, it will do IPv4, IPv6, it's gonna do a whole bunch of stuff and bring that out for you, super valuable. Yeah, m most of these platforms can integrate also with a Threat Intel platform, which is really useful both for, for maybe extracting things and, and pushing them into something like MISP as an event or even consuming Threat Intel lists from, from, your, from your tip to, to automatically enrich or, or maybe um, you know, increase or decrease a, 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 you know, a, some risk value or something like that. Um, and uh, so bi-directional integration is, is something you typically find with these as well. Uh, attachment and URL detonation. Uh, they will integrate in with your sandbox of choice. It will send things to Cuckoo. It will send things to Opswat. Uh, God forbid, it could even send things to Virus Total if that's your, your choosing method. Um, they're not necessarily included, but these are all plugins and workers you can use. Yara scanning. This is super super valuable. Um, you know, it's not always easy to find a, a place to run your your Yara engine and apply your Yara rules. Um, this is just a plug-in in, in all these file analysis frameworks, so um, very, very um, beneficial to be able to do that um, immediately, automatically, as, again, as the email is kind of entering the organization. And once again, at the end of it, it creates some sort of file 
that then is ingested into your threat analysis platform. Uh, that could be a SIM, it could be a CSV if you're named Rob Lee, could be whatever, but you have a lot of <laughs> different options. So after this, sure, they provide hashes, IPs, URLs, bodies, headers, customer analysis, unlimited flexibility, horizontal scale, and a way to <laughs> quickly search this trove of info, but what have file analysis frameworks ever done for you? Hopefully at this point you do see the value and where we're going with this. Let's actually run through creating threat intelligence using a FAST. Yeah, so first of all, the, um, we did a lot of work on this um, talk with, uh, with Stoke File Analysis Framework. It's created by Punch Cyber, the local company here. A lot of you probably know, know about Punch. Marcus is, is here in the audience, joined us today. Um, he's the primary author. He's just done a really genius job, in my opinion, with this, with this project. Um, Nick also uh, has helped us a ton with um, just some, some of the technical details of um, getting it deployed and, and, and tying all these pieces together. So we'd like to, to thank those guys. And honestly, you know, they, they could be giving this talk as well. Um, but uh, big, big kudos to those folks. Um, here's what we built. Um, and so we, we talked about, you know, can we do this after, or do it in parallel? So um, the, the idea here is to use a, a configuration that's available inside Office 365 to do a BCC. Um, it's a little bit kludgy, um, but we're, we're, we're doing the best that we can with that, right? So um, we, take, we, take, we take what they give us. Um, so we BCC all the messages to an external analysis pipeline. Um, in this case, we're using Postfix as the MTA just to, to handle some of the email communication. We use Stoke to do the file analysis, as we've, as we've talked about a bit. Um, Stoke creates JSON output. And you can analyze that a lot of different ways. Um, we, we are going to show you a little bit of, of using that in Splunk. Um, and you could even, you know, although we're not going to talk about it a lot today, you could even um, easily sort of can extend this pipeline and continue to add things into a threat platform like MISP. Um, and even, um, you know, then, you know, publish threat lists that are then consumed, in a, you know, by, by, by these tools as well. Um, there's a lot of different ways to put these, these building blocks together. So I know my fellow neckbeards in the room right now are, are thinking, yeah, but what about scale? Does this scale? Uh, the file analysis frameworks have been used at some of the largest Fortune 10 plus companies in the world. Uh, I have personally seen them work for millions, tens of millions of files and emails a day. Uh, so they do absolutely scale. Uh, Postfix, this has been a problem solved for 30 years or so, like scaling email horizontally. We have that one pretty far down. The one we're not sure at, so you can throw a rock at our little gra glass uh, castle, is the BCC. Uh, we can't get any evidence from anyone, documentations about the scale that Office 365 will output at BCC. Uh, Splunk, oddly enough, was not willing to fund a 150,000 person test lab. Um, if anyone has that, I would love to try it. Uh, but we are pretty sure that they have cloud pretty good at Microsoft and they can scale, so we're, we're pretty happy with this. Uh, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Stoke, super easy to set up. Uh, it's literally about four four lines of code to get up and going, uh, instantiating a Python instance. Use Python 3.6, uh, yes, it is the 21st century, you should be using Python 3. Um, three lines, uh, configure postfix to ingest email, and then plugins. So plugins are what drives every file analysis framework, and let's talk about those. Yeah, so, yeah, we we're, were having uh, arguments about a good metaphor for file analysis framework, but we came up with the centrifuge, so the idea you throw um, throw a file into the, the, the analysis framework and it's going to tell you is it something that's matching a, a, a malicious signature or, you know, what kind of file is it or um, even, you know, uh, evaluating email messages like, like what, what we're talking about here. Um, I, I was going to go with log chipper because I like the idea of just throwing files into the log chipper and whatever you throw at it can handle, but we went with centrifuge. Yeah, I'm not from Iowa. I made the slide. That's right. All right, so one of the cool things about Stoke, and, and, and I think the other, the other platforms as well, but we're very familiar with how, how Stoke does this, is really everything is, is sort of um, abstracted out into plugins. And so um, you have ingestion plugins, and you have worker plugins, and you have output plugins, and, and you know, plugins that unzip files, or plugins that you know, can, can decode um, you know, all various formats and, and encodings. Um, there's a whole bunch of plugins that come with Stoke um, right out of the box. Chances are if you decide to use Stoke, you are just going to be using some of the out-of-the-box plugins, but it's very extensible as well. 
as long as you write good, clean Python 3 code, you can. <laughs> Mar Marcus everyone, allows it to be plugged in. Everyone has that, right? Marcus is the is the the, the Pythonista in in our lives. Um, so some of the plugins we used in this little um, uh, demo environment were the hash plugin to to extract hashes from attachments, um, Yara plugin, Exif, and, and Trid. Trid is pretty cool. It'll allow you to. Um, sort of automatically identify what kind of a file something is. So some neat analysis you can do there. Hey, this thing is an exe, but it is you know has a JPEG um, file extension. Those kinds of things. And um, when you're done, you get a really nice JSON summary. Um, this is what comes out of Stoke. And uh, hope you found that useful. Yeah. So in conclusion, um, <laughs> shit. Did we did we have. We have more time. Okay, I think we let's, have, let's, yeah, I think there's more a few slides. more, yeah. One, one uh, yeah. more thing, okay? We're, we're gonna keep going here. This is what it looks like when you do it in Beautify, right? That is some sexy threat intel stuff out of every single email coming into your organization, right? We've extracted out an MD5 that was in your email. Uh, we've extracted out IPv4, it will also do IPv6. I hope to retire before I see that happening consistently. Um, email, so those are three email addresses that were in the SMTP session. Right, you'll notice one of them, Ubuntu at EC2, that's actually the AWS instance that we ran. Uh, in production, you'd probably just whitelist that, kind of whitelist what you need to within there. Uh, and then all the domains. So those were all the domains that were in the header and the body. And also would have been domains that were in files or anything else like that that was extracted. Some other examples, uh, although there was an attachment, uh, I write poor Yara, Yara rules, so none of them hit. Um, TRID, it was most likely a Windows executable. It was, in fact, a Windows executable and all the hashes. Going back to our dude, where's my hash? We got all the hashes, what hash do you want? Uh, we turned on to 256, but if you wanted to go to 512, that wouldn't be a problem either. And then of course, exif information. Uh, one other aspect about this, Stoke and these other tools allow you to archive all the attachments coming in into a Bloom filter capable directory schema. So that means that every single attachment that enters or leaves your organization, depending on how you want to configure it, could be saved for future or later analysis, right? Uh, which is pretty fun. That's pretty texty. Um, I know people like CSVs, but that's kind of hard to do your analysis with. So let's, let's do better. Let's upgrade. Yep, so one of the, the cool things about the most recent version of Stoke um, is that it, it, it outputs really clean logs in JSON format that are easy to parse and easy to um, do all kinds of analysis on. Um, and um, previous versions, there were separate events for maybe different workers, and you'd have to, to tie those together, which you can still do it that way, but um, I, I love this one email message is one JSON, um, uh, one JSON entry, um, and this is just what it looks like in, in, in Splunk. There's, there's a few different, if you expand that out, you know, there's, um, if you kind of dive down into that JSON, there's all sorts of results for all the different workers that have run the ones we mentioned, TRID and, and Yara and, and, and the hash plugin, et cetera. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, at this point, right, this data that comes in is not threat intel, right? This is just a bunch of metadata about the email coming into your organization. And you can use something, in this case we're using Splunk, to do all kinds of analysis on, on that. You can look for, you know, every, every um, uh, you know, recipient that received a certain hash or everybody that got a certain message in a certain period of time from a certain uh, email address or domain. These are things that are very, very easy to do. Um, this is just a simple search that I did that, that, that uh, tallied up some of the, the plugins. Um, another thing you can do is normalize um, and, and normalize to some taxonomy. Um, in our world, we, we have this taxonomy called the com Common Information Model, which I'm not trying to push that, but um, it does unlock a lot of capabilities and as far as like there, there's literally like huge libraries of, of searches and detections and investigations that use that taxonomy. So if you map to it, um, you can take advantage of all that stuff really fast. Um, and um, this is just showing how easy it is based on like the, the really well formatted logs to, to do a, a, a normalization exercise and like that. It really ties back to David's talk the other day about having JSON data that's normalized you know, imagine if David had been able to have threat indicators that had already been pre-labeled or had a movable schema like this to be able to extract and input, right? This sort of thing he went through that you can start avoiding to have the pain of yourself possibly. One of the things that, that we, we talked about in, in, in some previous talks that we've done is, is mining your incident data and your event data. So when you have something that's fired in your environment, an incident, 
Um, you know, you might want to go back and enrich that with a whole, all sorts of metadata from maybe an email message, um, and then store that stuff as local thread intel, right? Which is, as we've we've heard, is the best thread thread intel. Um, there's a here's a, a screenshot of of a uh, a popular for, for this it's at least popular um, GitHub repo. It allows you to easily like push things into MISP from Splunk, which we we used quite a bit, and it works really well. So earlier we talked about the 13 fields you can get out of a message trace field. Uh, this screenshot shows every single one of the SMTP fields that Stoke was able to extract dynamically. Right? There's typos in there because we have our, our corpus is heavily uh, spammy, which means there's mistakes in the SMTP headers that we have now captured. We have every single one of these, a corpus of I think it's 190 emails that we tested with. Um, what that meant is we had 131 unique SMTP fields compared to the 13 that Office 365 provided us via message trace logs, right? That is a huge treasure trove of information. Um, I love that. A lot of my threat hunting, uh, my background is around APTs and hunting through emails, and this helped us crush things, uh, being able to have that visibility, and I hate that I lost that in Office 365. Um, and what this does as time goes on, you create a treasure trove of information for your threat intel analysts or you as an analyst to go back into and pivot, right? As you find a new indicator or you're curious if this has been seen before in your environment, now you have all this metadata at your fingertips to pivot back into and look into and make correlations to that you've never had access to before or that you couldn't because the logs expire in 90 days in Office 365. Forgot to mention that too. Years ago, Dave and I talked about creating our own threat victory garden. Um, if you're making data soup for a threat intel analyst. They're always hungry for data. Hopefully we've given you guys some uh, helpful ways to kind of grow your victory garden to build your soup base and get to your trough shoe, right? And uh, have that tasty, tasty threat intel at your fingertips. Takeaways, uh, getting value out of the cloud email is actually surprisingly difficult. They built their logging for diagnostics, not for security investigations. And, you know, although it's not necessarily necessary, right, to, to use um, a file analysis framework. We, we wanted to add, add in um, maybe some visibility into what a platform like that can do and how it can help you um, along the way in a, a project like this. Yep. Integrate your search tools so you can go back in time. Things shouldn't be static. You should just be able to go, go, go and have that data for as long as you can, as long as it's within the GDPR requirements, as we discussed earlier. Um, <laughs> one thing I will say that we didn't bring up uh, for the eagle-eyed people in the room, you probably noticed you're also able to ingest the entire body of the email into Stoke. I did ask for a change. Marcus pushed it not that long ago. Uh, you can do a GDPR option where it does not ingest the body, although it will extract the IOCs out. Um, if that is of help to you and talk to your lawyer, mileage may vary, don't get executed. I'm not really sure how GDPR works. Um, <laughs> which really goes into feeding into the loop of your analysis, right? Uh, everything should have an action. You're doing threat intel for a purpose. Threat intelligence analysis just for the purpose of analysis isn't really purposeful, right? You're trying to help people. You're trying to save people. Matt's talk was inspirational for that. Um, so let's get some stuff out there. Yep. So a couple of things we mentioned in this talk. So Stoke is available at the first URL there, stoke.punchcyber.com. Another big thanks to them. Um, and there's an updated um, TA if you have Splunk and want to um, try to ingest some of this data. Um, you can grab that um, very, very simple little TA that, that we uh, pushed out there, but, um, and we'll probably make some improvements to that over time, but, um, but that's, that's out there as well. And we didn't actually say it explicitly, but Stoke is open source, in yeah. case we weren't clear on that. Um, I'm Ryan Kovar. I'm Dave Harold, And that's our presentation. Thank you.